Hello, today we'll take a critical look at this shoe on head video, which I would regard as a fail video pretty much, because it's mostly baseless claims and shitty arguments, really. I watched this video like 15 times, and I've responded to it on different websites over the years, and now, for the first time, I'm attempting an analysis of it here on YouTube, so consider this the grand finale. Now, I have no idea of your background, how well versed you are in the subject of pedophilia, for all I know, you could be a researcher, or an expert in the field, or an average Joe, and I can't please everyone, but feel free to ask questions, or provide criticism in the comments. The subject already being as difficult as it is, all I'm asking is that you try to keep an open mind. Nothing I will say in the next half an hour or so should be extreme or unreasonable. Okay, so the clips I'm responding to are rather short, as Shu has this habit of making arguments and claims at a very fast pace. But if you feel this bothers you, then you can always follow the link in the description and watch her entire video to make sure I don't take her out of context. So, let's start this thing. A map is a minor attracted person. Basically, it is a cute little nickname pedophiles are giving themselves in order to get good PR. It's like calling people who stomp puppies to death doggy stumpy steppy boys. Arguably, it should be evident for everyone what's wrong with comparing pedophiles and animal abusers. By definition, animal abusers have done something horrible, whereas that's not the case with pedophiles, since someone can be sexually attracted to kids, that is, the definition of pedophilia, without acting on it. Repeating something so obvious video after video is truly tedious, but the distinction between pedophile and child molester is an essential one, and it hardly can be overemphasized. What's curious is that Shu even seems to know this, as we hear later on, but is using the analogy anyway. This implies that she's either intellectually dishonest, as she's antagonizing a group of people with a comparison she knows to be false, or she actually thinks having a fantasy in your head is just as bad as abusing a sentient animal. Whichever the case, she's not off to a great start. Now we could spend literally all day debating on what is to be done about these pedos. Should they be put into therapy? Mental institutions? Should they be castrated? Thrown against the wall? How about treating them on individual basis? Just a thought. They are now trying to squeeze themselves into the LGBT community. And do not be mistaken, the LGBT community ain't having that shit. They know they are snakes trying to co-opt their movement, preying on people's empathy and tolerance. Basically, what we see here is Shu using loaded language. What's wrong with that then? Well, it's fallacious when it's utilized as a foundation for an argument or in place of an argument. Although hearing about logical fallacies might be a turn-off for many people, just bear with me for a minute. A word or phrase is loaded when it has a secondary, evaluative meaning in, that, in addition to its primary, descriptive meaning. When language is loaded, it is loaded with its evaluative meaning. A loaded word is like a loaded gun, and its evaluative meaning is the bullet. Here we have some simple examples of loaded words. But here's the important bit. Loaded words is a sub-fallacy of begging the question, because to use loaded language fallaciously is to assume an evaluation that has not been proved, thereby failing to fulfill the burden of proof. Let's briefly take a look at the example they provide and then return to Shu's claims. The Supreme Court has just flinched from its responsibility to stop the unjust jailing of two journalists, not charged with any wrongdoing, by a runaway prosecutor who will go to any lengths to use the government's contempt power to force them to betray their confidential sources. Okay, so some of the loaded words were flinched, a negatively loaded word suggesting that the court acted from fear or with a thoughtless reflex rather than on principle, a less loaded term is refused. Runaway. A negative term, a runaway prosecutor is one who is out of control, an unpredictable or more neutrally an independent one. Betray. Though this word can mean reveal, it is related to betrayal, thus suggesting treachery and disloyalty. Now, it's probably even easier to spot the loaded expressions in Shu's rhetoric, as they're so obvious. I'm going to play the clip again, so you can try yourself to find them. They are now trying to squeeze themselves into the LGBT community. And do not be mistaken, the LGBT community ain't having that shit. They know they are snakes trying to co-opt their movement, preying on people's empathy and tolerance. 
That's right, it's definitely loaded to assert that pedophiles are snakes and are preying on people's empathy and tolerance, and it's fallacious because Shu doesn't prove their evaluative meaning. That is, she doesn't demonstrate pedophiles to be collectively dishonest, a characteristic we traditionally affix to someone being snake-like, nor does she prove that they have a nefarious agenda, which involves them taking advantage of people's empathy and tolerance. In fact, she provides no reason to think maps are preying on these sentiments any more than any other minority does. She just assumes it. And it doesn't matter if you're a Shu's fan or not. You should be able to concede when her arguments are simply bad. And if you're unable to do that, then you evidently care more about idolizing her instead of what's factual. Some of these maps call themselves no maps. No maps means no contact minor attracted person. No maps are basically the virtue signaling version of maps. I have the urge to strangle you, but I'm a no strangler strangler. So if you're someone attracted to kids and you point out that you're responsible, apparently that's virtue signaling. Of course, I'm pretty sure that if Let's say a conservative proactively defends himself or herself by saying they are not racist. Shu, as a conservative herself, wouldn't consider that virtue signaling at all, even though it's completely analogous to what the anti-contact map is doing. They are both challenging or resisting a stereotype. Surely, if you approve of a conservative responding to general accusations like this, you probably shouldn't bitch and moan when other people are doing the exact same. Admittedly, virtue signaling is a real concept. The problem is that it's very difficult to point to exactly which individuals are doing this, because you can't read people's minds to ascertain they are not sincere in their statements. Shu isn't even claiming some individual pedophile's virtue signaling, but that all maps who say they are against molestation are guilty of this, seemingly implying that it's impossible for them to genuinely have an unfavorable opinion of child adult sex. I don't know about Shu, but I think child molestation is a horrendously unethical crime. So why would I think zero pedophiles could figure this out? I mean, just think about it. The more wrong you think it is, the less it makes sense to argue no pedophiles could see this wrongness. So Shu either doesn't think it's horribly detestable to molest kids, or then she doesn't think very hard at all, which is my guess, because in the same clip she also introduces the concept of non-strangler strangler as an analogy to anti-contact maps. I'm sorry Shu, but that literally makes no sense. You're either a strangler or a non-strangler, you can't be both. Comparing pedophiles to people with a fantasy involving strangling or some other BDSM elements might work, but I'm pretty sure a non-strangler strangler is not a fucking thing. For the record, so far Shu has used two analogies, neither of which makes sense, and we are only two minutes in. Children cannot consent. End of. It has absolutely nothing to do with sexuality or love. When you are a gay person in love with another gay person, you can both consent, date, have sex, get married, grow old together, and live a happy, long life together. Pedophiles can't do this! I'm so glad we have Shu to tell us what constitutes sexuality and love, how lost we would be without her. Surely this isn't just an ad hoc explanation to support her beliefs. Now, Shu's contribution does have some merit in the sense that it draws our attention to the fuzziness of concepts such as sexuality and love. As an example, there are some people, not necessarily Shu, but some people, who understand the term sexuality only in connection with biological gender. That is to say, if a concept isn't linked with gender in some meaningful way, then it doesn't signify sexuality to these people. Of course, the fact that we talk about things such as sex crimes or sexual arousal, also in the context of people who exhibit unusual sexual preferences, and that there's no confusion around these concepts, highlights that this very narrow view of sexuality as only manifesting biological gender is, in my opinion, not a useful or accurate one. When it comes to love, well, there are different types of love, as everyone knows. And as I'll show, there might even be different types of sexuality, besides the straight gay continuum. So, it's often the case that these concepts mean slightly different things for different people, illustrating why the whole debate whether pedophilia is a sexuality can get pretty complicated and frustrating pretty fast. But let's pause to analyze Shu's points in more detail. What I glean from this is that Shu has a definite belief that pedophilia isn't or cannot be a sexuality, and here we see her rationalizing that belief. As is oftentimes the case with contrived ad hoc explanations, hers exhibits some serious flaws, 
For example, she implies that if you can't get married, it's not a sexuality. By this logic, ironically, Shu's own counterexample, homosexuality, isn't a sexuality in places where gay marriage is illegal. She also argues pedophilia has got nothing to do with sexuality or love, because kids can't consent and you can't be with them romantically. Well, this would kinda entail that firstly, unrequited love is not love either, because it involves neither consent nor reciprocity, and secondly, that incels, people who are involuntarily celibate, don't have a sexuality due to the nature of their predicaments. Now, of course, incels aren't destined to be incels forever, but while they are, by definition they can't have consensual sex, otherwise they wouldn't be incels. Since we generally think unrequited love is a form of love, and that not being able to get consent to have sex with someone doesn't mean you magically don't have a sexuality, Shu's arguments are not very convincing in my opinion. Besides, and by the way I could have responded with just this, her standard for what constitutes sexuality and love is completely arbitrary. That's no different from a homophobe proclaiming that homosexuality is not a legitimate sexuality because you can't procreate with another gay person. While it's true that kids can't consent to sex and that gays can't procreate together, there's no reason why these should be the factors determining whether something is a sexuality, and that's why I called her standard arbitrary. Fortunately for us, we don't have to listen to only shoe or homophobes as the authorities on sexuality and love. When we consult science on this, the findings seem to allow an interpretation that pedophilia is what could be considered a sexual age orientation, that pedophiles do indeed experience love toward children, and that it's hardwired in the brain, that is, there is a neuroanatomical component to it, but more about that later on. Most maps, as you will see in a little bit, have what's called an age of attraction. I actually feel sick. So they have an age of attraction, or AOA as they call it, like 2 to 7, 5 to 8, 6 to 9. Very normal, well-adjusted humans here. Yeah, well, it's not just maps, it's most people who have an age of attraction. It basically means you prefer one age group over another. Telephiles have an age of attraction too, it's just higher. There's nothing weird about that in and of itself. This is just a minor point, but I wanted to throw that in. That is why this shit is not a sexuality. Because children grow up. You cannot have a life with a child. They are not children forever. You want to use and abuse these kids, then toss them aside. My previous critique should apply here as well. There's once again no compelling reason why that should be the criterion for sexuality. No one thinks telephiles who want to divorce don't have a sexuality. Not even when they're Hollywood celebrities who purposely switch to younger partners just because they can. In fact, you could even see an evolutionary advantage in the tendency of a male switching to younger, more fertile partners, especially if they don't have young offspring anymore from their previous relationship. Admittedly, this hardly translates into an argument for an evolutionary component in pedophilia, since obviously children aren't fertile, but the idea of tossing aside your partner because of their age, though morally questionable and indeed rude, might not be as unnatural or unheard of as Shu makes it out to be. In short, it can't be a criterion for sexuality when many so-called normal people do it as well, without anyone questioning their sexuality. Now, as mentioned, you can't procreate in a pedophilic relationship, so perhaps antis are onto something here. Of course, if you are using the line of reasoning to assert pedophilia isn't a sexuality, then neither would be homosexuality, for the same reason. So if you think being gay is a sexuality, you are out of luck again. And no, I don't agree with sexual or romantic child-adult relationships. I think I've made this clear in all of my videos, but apparently some people just can't pay attention. I'm once again repeating it to prevent being potentially misunderstood, even though for me it's obvious that the discussion about pedophilia as a sexuality is distinct from the debate whether it's okay to act on it. It's just some fucked fetish at most, like necrophilia or bestiality, which by the way, a lot of these maps, those things overlap each other. First Shu claims pedophilia has got nothing to do with sexuality, and then she reckons that it's a fetish, so which one is it? Fetishes are sexual expressions or preferences. Nevertheless, since pedophilia appears to be hardwired in the brain, like homosexuality, it probably should be distinguished from fetishes, which are more commonly thought of as psychological rather than neuroanatomical. 
Not that having a fetish even is a justification to shun somebody, although she, being conservative, maybe disagrees and it's missionary position all the way for her, but back to pedophilia being hardwired. Here's a series of quotes on James Cantor's notable 2008 study that found brain's white matter volumes to be linked with pedophilia. White matter can be understood to function as the wiring of the brain, so it provides connectivity between different parts of the brain. I have to warn that for the next few minutes it might be a bit difficult to follow along because things get quite scientific and technical, but I don't think I can do this any other way than to delve straight into what the science says. The first quote is from a 2012 study called White Matter Volumes in Pedophiles, Hebephiles and Teleophiles. Finally, our own team analyzed 65 patients and 62 men who committed non-sexual offenses. This sample was large enough to permit a statistically non-biased analysis of the entire brain, rather than requiring focus on pre-selected brain structures. This revealed widespread differences in white matter regions in the parietal and temporal lobes, specifically the superior frontal occipital fasciculus bilaterally and the right arcuate fasciculus. This pattern of results was consistent with the conclusion that the various grey matter structures are related to the propensity to break the law, whereas the white matter deficits are related to pedophilia itself. Okay, so pedophiles' brains appear to be different, but correlation doesn't mean causation, right? And if there should be causation, which exactly causes which? The next quote is about the possibility that pedophilia might cause white matter deficiencies, something that would also explain the results. Also limiting the plausibility of this interpretation, that is, pedophilia causes white matter deficiencies, is the accumulating evidence that pedophilic men neuroanatomically differ from non-pedophilic men early in life. For example, handedness preferences are exhibited in utero, and the odds of non-right-handedness are three times higher in pedophilic than in non-pedophilic men. Although one might hypothesize behaviors of adulthood that could plausibly reduce white matter volumes into noted fiber bundles, it is more difficult, although still possible, to hypothesize what behaviors that a pre-pedophilic infant or fetus might exhibit that would do so. Because white matter appears to be involved in the recognition of sexually relevant stimuli in humans, Cantor concludes the study by arguing the most reasonable explanation is that it's the other way around that is these unusual white matter configurations that are linked with the etiology of pedophilia. He also suggests a mechanism for this, something Cantor would later own up as the cross-wiring hypothesis in the media. In this regard, I link to these pretty decent news articles in the description, so you can check them out. That being said, in my opinion, the cross-wiring hypothesis is not exactly without any flaws. For instance, some of the conclusions drawn by pedophilia being hardwired are I feel unevidenced. To be specific, to this date I haven't found any research that indicates pedophile's nurturing instinct is somehow affected or deviant, or any research on their nurturing instinct at all, something they would absolutely have to have to posit that pedophilia is true cross-wiring of sexual and nurturing instincts, because that's just the way burden of proof works. Also, there's no real evidence that the two instincts are mutually exclusive in some inherent way. But what's relevant for us here is that the main finding, that pedophilia is hardwired in the brain, seems quite well established given the evidence from the MRI studies. Finally, to summarize all of this, I'll use an excerpt from Cantor's own blog. Sadly, the link doesn't work anymore, but these are Cantor's words. If you're skeptical, as you should be, you can put some of these sentences on Google and you'll still get relevant results. Although it is now known that certain brain structures respond to environmental stimulation, such as the motor cortex, there is no evidence that such stimulation causes any changes in the superior frontal occipital fasciculus or right arcuate fasciculus, the brain regions in which pedophiles and non-pedophiles differ. Moreover, the brain regions we identified are extremely large, and no previous research has ever found changes in such large regions of the brain. As an analogy, physical exercise will generally stimulate one's muscle tissue to grow, but one would not grow an extra arm. Neurological changes occur only in a very specific manner. Now, someone who contends that pedophilia is a fetish might protest and say, we observe in pedophilia the effects of early childhood experiences as well, namely that child molesters seem to create pedophiles through victimization. This is a very common myth, which I'll briefly address here before we go to the next script. 
while some findings do indicate this, there's no need to jump to any hard conclusions. Firstly, even if child molestation did increase the likelihood that the victim would grow up to be a child molester, this isn't yet proof that molestation causes pedophilic interest, as there are other ways to explain this. It's a well-known fact that childhood abuse tends to affect the development of empathy in children, and statistically, we would expect people with less empathy to commit sex crimes, right? Alternatively, if the abuse becomes abuser later on, this could merely reflect a sort of vicious cycle. Indeed, it's also well known that children who are physically abused by their parents sadly tend to raise their own children in likewise manner, illustrating the same psychological effect. These aren't by any means the only arguments against this idea of childhood molestation causing pedophilia, but this response to Shu's comment about it being a fetish is probably long-winded enough as it is, so let's move on. Ex-offender, anti-contact pedophile. You cannot be an ex-offender. Isn't that like saying you can't be an ex-meat eater or an ex-democrat voter? And this isn't me trying to minimize the seriousness of sex crimes which may ruin people's lives. Those who are guilty of such heinous acts deserve both moral and judicial condemnation, no doubt. It's still a fact that just because you did something in the past doesn't mean you're destined to keep repeating it. When we consult official figures and reports, it turns out it's rather a persistent myth than reality that sex offenders' recidivism is off the charts or that there's no hope in rehabilitating them. Although, needless to say, it boils down to the individual offender, how receptive they are of treatment and therapy, or if they even want to change their behavior, and it certainly would be naive to insist all child molesters are redeemable. Also, there's just something super suspicious about all these map accounts that are constantly on about how not diddled your kids will be. Like, their entire timeline is just about how so anti-diddling kids they are. Yeah, because according to you, they're all a bunch of people just virtue signaling. We get it. But seriously, when the most common misunderstanding of pedophiles is that they're all offenders, it shouldn't come as a surprise that they resist this stereotype. After all, doing anything else, including not saying anything, would effectively amount to confirming it, for the simple reason that it's the status quo. And if you want to fight status quo, well, you have to say something at the very least. But let's say it were the other way around, and they were saying how pro-molestation they were. I bet she would complain about that as well. It's this catch-22-ish tactic she's using to get to her conclusion that all pedos are bad, no matter what they say or do, that once again signals to me that she's intellectually dishonest and arguing in bad faith. Look at this tweet. Look at it. How the hell did they think this was some kind of gotcha? Ha, huh, these people who are anti having sex with kids are so silly. They think their kids are sexy enough for me to want to have sex with them. First I thought I wouldn't even respond to this, because to be honest, I don't know if that guy on Twitter is being serious, although Shu somehow seems to know that he is. Be that as it may, I think it has to be pointed out that when people say anti in these contexts, they usually don't mean those who are anti-molestation, as Shu thinks they do. They refer to people who are anti-pedophiles, and they really are not the same thing. There's a rather big difference between being against real crimes and being against thought crimes. So basically, you get the point. They're trying to normalize something very dangerous, trying to make it look friendly, cute, trying to make their own little community and be accepted and push themselves into the LGBT community. I've talked about language a lot in my videos, and I feel I must talk about it some more here, because dangerousness as a concept is far from unproblematic, and when it's used without defining it some way, it's quite difficult to even address comments such as this one by Shu, and not because she's making such a stellar argument, but rather because she's saying something ambiguous. I mean, are we talking about dangerousness of individuals from someone's perspective, because they can't trust them due to not knowing them well enough, or dangerousness on a group level? There are many groups of people or segments within a population, besides pedophiles, that have the statistical risk of committing different crimes. I could use certain minorities as examples, but I don't even need to. Just being male increases your risk on a group level to be a rapist. And indeed, there are some extreme radical feminists who use this biological fact as a justification to demonize men by deeming them all dangerous. It's precisely here that we should be able to see how dangerousness on a group level doesn't translate flawlessly to dangerousness on an individual level, which demonstrates that the concept is problematic due to its ambiguity. 
So, if you want to appeal to dangerousness as an argument for the stigmatization of pedophiles, I feel that you need to first specify what you mean, that is, how the dangerousness of pedophiles is distinct from the dangerousness of males in general, for example, unless, of course, you do think the radical feminists are right in dehumanizing males. But in my experience, antis tend to ignore all these requests to have them improve their arguments, because for them, it seems it's not about having a rational, coherent worldview, but one that satisfies their emotional need to have a scapegoat, and that's why they don't mind inconsistency in how they antagonize groups of people or minorities. But even if we disregard these language problems that I seem to obsess over and say, for the sake of the argument, that pedophiles are dangerous, well, the alternative for accepting these individuals is to not accept them and, in effect, drive them underground. Many would concede that schizophrenia is dangerous too, but this hardly means we ought to ostracize people with this condition. So, even if we establish that some group of people pose a risk, we still have to make a separate argument for why they need to be marginalized. If we believe pedophiles could benefit from therapy or treatment and that this reduces sex crimes, is it not then our very moral obligation to rather reduce stigma so that they can reach for this help? Besides, not condemning the attraction is not the same as approving of sex crimes, as exemplified by the way our judicial systems work, convicting of the act, not the attraction. In an arguably similar way, our society is generally okay with people indulging in violent video games, while rigorously punishing both morally and legally those who go out and start shooting real people. They're using people's empathy against them, and I've even fell for this before. I have fallen for their pity party. Do not fall for their pity party. So, Shu basically repeats her claim about pedophiles being snakes that are preying on people's good intentions. This time, however, she's a bit more direct, and appears to argue that maps or pedophiles have a conspiracy. They don't just want fair treatment, recognition for non-offenders and support. No, they are in for something else, something more sinister. Admittedly, there are pedophiles, such as those in Nambla, who are trying to normalize child adult sex, and that's the other side of the coin. Then again, there are Muslims who are jihadists and Christians who are Westboro Baptist Church nutcases, so therefore we can label them all as that? I don't think it works that way, Shu. And for anyone who might have a problem with this analogy, it's good enough, I think, as there really is no biological or any other kind of necessity for a pedophile to think it's okay to molest children, even though they're attracted to them. In other words, their sexuality doesn't have to determine their philosophy. By the way, we're almost at the end, just one more clip to respond to. I'm aware that these types of videos aren't the easiest to follow, so thanks for sticking around all the way here. If and when you see dumbass conservatives picking up this story and saying things like pedophiles are now in the LGBT community, tell them to shut the fuck up because that's not happening. Only pedophiles support pedophiles. At least Shu is right in one thing. The LGBT folks don't accept pedophiles. These are people who get immensely buttered at the sheer mention that there might be anything in common between gays and pedophiles, calling such comparisons homophobic attacks, yet ironically see themselves nothing problematic in labeling all pedophiles as child molesters in an attempt to distance themselves from pedos. Anyway, don't want to start ragging on gays and trans folks here, they are discriminated against too. And for all the maps out there trying to get into the LGBT, if that doesn't happen, that's not the end of the world, because the arguments for non-offending pedophiles are perfectly strong enough to stand on their own. And that's all that matters if we are confident, as I am, that eventually truth and reason will win in society. Finally, Shu claims that only pedos defend pedos, on a video where she sets out to convince people that maps are bad, something kinda redundant if only pedos defend pedos. But seriously, what about all these studies? news articles, documentaries and films that all, in a sense, defend non-offending pedophiles or normalize them to use anti's rhetoric. While theoretically all of the authors could be pedos, that's not realistic. And even if they were, Shu utterly fails to demonstrate that they are wrong. To summarize, in my opinion, her video was an atrocious display of poor logic, ignorance and general cluelessness. I'm aware that my response to Shu was quite hostile. But at least I'm not the one comparing innocent people to animal abusers and stranglers. I'm not the one conflating being responsible with virtue signaling. 
I'm not the one shunning people for only doing what's right and sacrificing their sexuality to preserve someone else's innocence. I was hostile because I want to be honest, and I honestly don't like this fucking thought siren too much. It's one thing to have a go at protected minorities that have some representation in society and SJWs and hate speech laws on their side, but when you bully people in need of help and yet ostracize to an extent almost impossible to imagine for views and money, that is just frightfully evil. Sorry for the negative ending. As a bit of compensation, my next video should be something quite different, something I haven't tried before on this channel. Not going to reveal what it is, so you'll have to wait and see. That's all I have. Thanks for listening.